Yeah, we back. Yeah, we back. Now, back again with another series, man. Another series. So I recently got my hands on this brand new book. As you can see, Black Crown by Paul Clammer. And this book just recently hit the streets, but it's a biography on the life of King Henry Christophe. Now, as you already know, like I mentioned before, I look at myself as the leading historian on the life of King Henry Christophe. I've always felt it was my duty and responsibility. I felt like the ancestor told me himself to uphold and promote his legacy. So in case you're new to my channel, go to my playlist section. I got endless information on the life of Christoph, military veteran in two revolutions, the American Revolution and the Haitian Revolution, established the most successful black state in the history of the Western Hemisphere, built the largest military fortress in the entire Western Hemisphere. Man, every chance I get, I gotta show love and respect and honor to the ancestor every chance I get. Now, I got my hands on this brand new book. I've been waiting on it. I've been hearing about it. Black Crown by Paul Clammer. Now, I would say that after me, because I'm the number one historian on Christoph on the planet, but I would say number two, you could say Paul Clammer. Yeah, he got it. You know, he got it. You know, I think yeah, he's a white dude from a Great Britain. And for whatever reason, he's been, you know, extremely interested in researching the life of Christoph and finding very exclusive information and documents that even I myself couldn't get my hands on. So I got respect for him for that. Always uncovering information that I didn't even know about. So in today's video, we're going to kick it off part one of a brand new series. We're going to read this book together, Black Crown by Paul Clammer. And as you know, I'm going to come in and out of my commentary. I'm going to be reviewing and giving my opinion, live reactions as I'm reading it, right? I'm reading it along with y'all, man. We're going to read it together. Black Crown, the latest biography on Christoph, man. I'm very excited about it. I'm very excited about it. Not wasting no time. Take a look up on the screen. How did a Caribbean child born into plantation slavery come to defeat Napoleon's armies in battle and crown himself king of the first free black nation in the Americas? This is the story of Henry Christoph, one of the most remarkable yet least known figures from the age of revolutions. Now, not wasting no time, man. Let's jump straight into chapter one. Let's go. In the closing months of 1818, Bound de Vasti, now time out. If y'all been following my channel, then you already know who that is. That's Christoph's right hand man. So when I, when you hear me say Bound de Vasti or just straight up Vasti, which his name is really pronounced Bound de Vate, but if you hear me say that name, just know that that's Christoph's right hand man they're referring to, right? That's his right hand man. Now let's continue. In the closing months of 1818, Bound de Vasti was sitting at his writing desk in Milo in northern Haiti, working hard on his brand new book an essay on the causes of the revolution and civil wars of Haiti. In this book, he would tell for the first time, not just the story of the slave revolution that had expelled the French from the world's richest colony, but also the central role played by Christophe, who was now in the seventh year of his reign as King Henry I. The instructions from Christophe were clear. My desire, he said, is that it may, with regards to my life, be a plain and clear statement of facts, and that those who knew me early in life, when they see these facts in the book, may vouch for the truth. Vasti worked inside the immense palace of Sanssouci, a three-story slice of neoclassical grandeur that was the pride of the Haitian kingdom. Now, I'm going to try to put some uh, some photos up on the palace. You know, this is the palace, obviously, in the modern day, but, you know, back in the day, the palace was, uh, you know, it was the greatest uh, building in the entire Caribbean. Now, let's continue. There was no finer building in the entire Caribbean. From his offices, Vasti could walk through the mirrored halls into grand reception rooms painted with scenes from classical mythology where the gods had been portrayed as African heroes or salons hung with portraits of the royal family by an English painter who had been engaged to teach at the King's Academy of Arts by William Wilberforce. The palace was kept fresh in a tropical climate by means of an elaborate system of pipes laid under the mahogany floors that brought in cool water from the surrounding mountains before feeding into the large fountain flanked by two bronze lions at the foot of the palace's grand staircase. Through the tall windows, Vasti could look out over the neatly kept royal gardens to the spreading star apple tree under which the king received petitions from his subjects every Thursday. After this was the separate palaces for the queen and the prince, the stables and coach house for Christoph's gilded state carriages imported from London, and the barracks and stables of the household regiment, from where the royal dragoons in their sky blue uniforms trotted out on parade. The Sanssouci Palace was commissioned by Christoph to be the symbol of a confident new political power. It was a place for entertainment, a center of learning to educate the sons of a new nobility, an accounting house for the coffee and sugar that provided the kingdom's wealth, all harvested by free farmers who had once toiled as slaves but were now paid fairly for their labors. A royal mint stamped coins with the king's likeness, and his coat of arms was displayed on the national newspaper, the Royal Gazette of Haiti, a newspaper printed at the palace's own printing press and distributed to the foreign merchants who traded in the kingdom's ports. Beyond all this, Vasti will be able to see the narrow road that wound up the dark green of the surrounding mountains of the great fortress of the citadel. 
hidden high in the clouds above. This masterpiece of modern military engineering was built under Kristoff's direct supervision and was defended with dozens of cannons that had been captured from the French, British, and Spanish armies that had fought unsuccessfully to control Haiti. Although foreigners were banned from visiting the citadel, it was said by observers to be able to garrison 3,000 troops. Now, if you take a look up on the screen, this is footage, I believe, from African Tigress. Shout out to the YouTuber African Tigress. She recently took a visit to the Citadel a couple months back, and I did a few reaction videos to her clips. Excellent content, as you can see, man. You know, the Citadel live and, live and direct, up close, man. Man, anyways, man, let's jump straight back into the book. Let's continue. Vasti was perfectly placed to write the story of the kingdom's spectacular rise. His father was a white colonist from Normandy who had married Elizabeth Mimi Dumas, who was born of a wealthy mixed race planter family from the town of Mamlad. Now, time out. Yes, Christos' right hand man, Bounty Vasti, yeah, he was a mulatto, you know what I'm saying? But he was a real one, though, you know what I'm saying? He was a real one. You gotta be a real one to be Christos' right hand man. And I believe uh, when Christoph uh, passed away and the kingdom fell, I believe Vasti was actually executed by the traitors who destroyed the kingdom. Now, anyways, let's get back into it. Vasti was educated in France and returned to the colony at age 15, where he joined Toussaint Louverture's armies. Ennobled as a baron by Christophe, Vasti had been given a cross quillin sword as his coat of arms. The heraldic choice was a good one. He had helped draft the kingdom's book of laws, known as the Code Henry, served as secretary to the king and tutor to the Prince Royal, and was soon to become keeper of the royal family's archives. As a writer, Vasti was vociferous in his defense of Christophe's administration. He had published a series of fierce broadsides aimed at the French government and its supporters who had once owned plantations in the country and still hoped to return Haiti to bondage. In 1814, he published The Colonial System Unveiled, a book that cataloged in raw detail the sadistic violence that had been the motor of the slave economy. Now, if you go to my playlist section, in fact, if you go to my homepage as well, you'll see I have a playlist entitled The Colonial System Unveiled. And I actually read that entire audiobook for free on my channel, man. For free on my channel. Like it said, man, it detailed in raw detail, explicit detail, no holes barred, no sugarcoat. What exactly happened to our foremothers and our forefathers on them plantations, man? On them sugarcane plantations, man. Live interviews, live, live references, man. Live quotes and interviews from people who lived through what happened. So go check out that book, man. That book, man, that book changed uh, that, that book changed something in me. I'll tell you that much. That book definitely changed something in me. Uh, they don't even teach this book in schools anywhere on the planet, man. Anyways, uh, let's get back into the book, man. Let's get back into the book. In 1814, he published The Colonial System Unveiled, a book that cataloged in raw detail the sadistic violence that had been the motor of the slave economy. And in doing so, he produced one of the earliest attacks on Western colonialism by a writer of African descent. Yes, indeed, man. Yes, indeed. One of the first official attacks. Because, listen, if you read the book, if you if you listen to me reading that book, then you know, man, the, the ancestors went straight at the heads of the enemy, man. No holes barred, man. That was a diss track to the enemies, man. That was a diss track to the adversary. Man, go listen, go listen to that playlist if you haven't. The Colonial System Unveiled is on my homepage. Now, let's continue. In his new work, Vasti was turning his attention to the revolution that had given birth to Haiti and that culminated in his eyes with the crowning of King Henry Christoph. A proper accounting of the king's rule and civilizing influence would strengthen the arguments against those who saw the very fact of Haiti's existence as an existential threat to its slaveholding neighbors. Vasti said, Having established our rights by the sword, we acquire a new luster in the eyes of the world when we defend them by the pen. Our reputation becomes greater and more glorious, and we include ourselves in reality in the number of civilized states. By the time Vasti was putting his pen to paper, Christophe had been a figure on the international scene for more than a decade. And the stories of his origins and his rise to power have been published in newspapers in Britain, the United States, and France. In seeking to explain him, these reports have frequently taken unknown sources and added details upon contradictory detail until the original truth was hard to discern. The fact that Christoph had not been born in the country he ended up ruling was universally agreed, but the rest was a tangle of conjecture. The idea of him being born in St. Kitts and thus having adopted the name of the island of his birth held obvious appeal, and this rapidly became the dominant narrative after it first appeared in the English newspapers back in 1805. Some had said that he was born a slave, others said that he was the child of free parents, wildly differing anecdotes suggested that he had been a cook, a tailor, or a mason, others said that he had fought and even been wounded while fighting in the American Revolutionary War, or that he had never been anything grander than a waiter in a colonial hotel, he had been all of these things or perhaps none of them at all. 
The truth, wrote Vasti, was that Christoph had been born in the British colonies at the opposite end of the Caribbean and Haiti, a great distance in every way from the future riches of the palace. The royal almanacs that the kingdom printed every year officially recorded that he was born on the 6th of October, 1767. The fact that he was born in the British colonies was important and was regularly brought up when Christophe was lobbying the British government for Haiti's independence. Jean-Gabriel Peltier, a journalist who served as Christophe's agent in London, would frequently pepper his correspondence to ministers at Whitehall with comments that Christophe was English by birth, and thus would make a loyal and intelligent ally to the British government against the French. For all of Vasti's certainty about Christophe's place of birth, he showed frustratingly little interest in recounting the early years of his subject's life. He would like, he tells us, to dwell more at length upon the more remarkable traits of the heroic life of Christophe. But alas, he had too little space in which to tell them. It was far better, perhaps, to focus on Christoph's achievement as monarch than to tarnish them by asking too many questions about his humble beginnings. Christoph himself only once publicly alluded to his origins in an account that was published long after his death. Declining the invitation from a Royal Navy captain to have dinner on his ship, he gave his reasons for never trusting to put his foot on board his ship. Christoph said, my father was brought across the sea from Africa, and he never returned. The sea is treacherous. Fortunately, two unpublished letters by British observers helped add detail to Vasti's brief account. In 1799, a man named Hugh Calfcart, a merchant who provided occasional intelligence reports to the British authorities in Jamaica, spent time with Christoph when he was on a campaign in the south of Saint-Omingue. That was Haiti at the time, the colony of Saint-Omingue. Over the following years, Cathcart and Christoph exchanged regular letters about future business relationships and were close enough to exchange intimacies about each other's families. During this early campaign, Cathcart reported back to his superiors that Christoph was a native of the British colonies and he had been living in Saint-Omingue for upwards of 20 years. He was formerly a manager of a hotel in the capital and a slave. He is now supposed to have amassed a fortune of $250,000. A second account comes from Edward Corbet, who was the British commercial agent in Port-au-Prince during the later years of the revolution. In early 1803, he sent an extensive report back to his superiors on the state of the war against the French, including short biographies of some of the leading lights, writing, the Negro chief Christophe is a Creole from Grenada and has a little education. Now, time out. When they say Christophe was a Creole, a Creole had a different meanings depending on where you went and in different colonies, right? So in the southern United States, a Creole was most likely, you know, a mixed race, multiracial person in Louisiana. But in other in other colonies like saint Omingue, a Creole was somebody who was born in the colony, right? If you were born in Africa, they called you, you know, you were a Bosal, right? But if you were born on the colony, right? You, if, you, if your mama had you on, on a plantation, you were born on a plantation, you were a Creole, right? Meaning that you weren't born in Africa. You weren't born in Europe. You were born on the colonies. You were born in the European colonies, most likely on a plantation. So Christoph was a Creole because he was born on a plantation, right? He never set foot in Africa, you know, things like that. So that's why they say he was a Creole. He was not a mixed race. Uh, he was not a man of mixed race. As you can see, Christoph was a was a dark skinned black man. And I also want to touch on the fact that they said back in what was it? 1803. Was it 1803 or 1799? Uh, yeah, it was 1803. They said Christoph had already amassed a fortune of two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. If you convert that to modern currency of today, um, that would approximately mean that in 1803, Christoph had about six million dollars. Six million dollars. Uh, now, if you watch that video I put out the other day uh, entitled The Wives and Children of the Haitian Revolution, you know, we spoke about, you know, Christoph, how he, you know, amassed his wealth very early on in life. You know, very early on in life, in his early 20s, Christoph was already engaged in commerce, buying and selling horses, managing a hotel, you know, holding a job. And, you know, Christoph was getting to the money at a very early age, man. So, yeah, in his early 30s, they said Christoph was worth $6 million. That's crazy. In 1803. Let's continue. As if in anticipation of later debates about Christoph's origins, he concluded that it is not perfectly known what led him to his present situation in the colony of Saint-Domingue. The use of Creole in this context means a person born in the Americas. But if Christoph had been in Saint-Omingue for 20 years when he met Cathcart and Corbet, he would still have been a child when he left the British colonies. What circumstances could have brought a boy born into obscurity halfway across the Caribbean to his new home? Now, some sources say that Christoph was born in St. Kitts. Some sources say that he was born in Grenada. You know, it's up in the air. Even in this book, they said it. They said some people said St. Kitts. Some people said Grenada. So, you know, I, I don't know, man. I don't even debate it. You know, I, I don't even debate it, man. You know, Christoph, man, I don't know where Christoph came from, man. Christoph just came, came from out of space, man. <laughs> Let's continue. 
Grenada is part of the Windward Island chain, sitting at the far southern rim of the Caribbean, just a day's sail from the Venezuelan coast, a mountainous almond-shaped island just 34 kilometers long. For centuries, it was home to the Calinago people, whose ocean-going war canoes discouraged repeated attempts at European colonization ever since it was visited by Christopher Columbus on his third voyage to the Americas. This changed in the 1600s, when the prosperous tobacco and sugar plantations of nearby British Barbados inspired the French to take full control of Grenada. A treaty was brokered with the Calinago to allow limited French settlement, but was quickly broken by the newcomers in a series of bloody massacres. God damn. God damn, man. <laughs> Golly. Let's continue. The native population plummeted, and the few remaining Calinago fled the island or took refuge in the densely forested slopes and ravines of the interior. Grenada's low lying areas were divided into plots for sugar and tobacco plantations, and the island was turned into a farm factory complex to make colonial goods to send to France. With no substantial native population left to press into a labor force, the colonists imported enslaved Africans to work on the plantations, profiting from the trade winds that made the transatlantic crossing from the west coast of Africa to the Windward Islands faster than to the rest of the Caribbean. Tiny Grenada produced modest profits throughout the 18th century, but it was overshadowed by the booming French colonies of Saint-Omingue and Martinique. Nevertheless, Grenada was subject to the same strict mercantilist trade rules laid down in Paris, which meant high import taxes and a strict curtailed ability to trade with its British Caribbean neighbors. Grenada resented the strictures laid down by this in Metropole, and when a Royal Navy squadron appeared on the horizon during the Seven Years' War, the colonists saw little benefit in defending French rule and surrendered without firing a single shot. At the war's conclusion in 1763, Grenada was formally ceded to Britain. At the time of the British takeover, Grenada's population was less than 14,000. As elsewhere in the Caribbean, the enslaved massively outnumbered the free. For every Grenadian citizen, there were nine more people in bondage. The free were not entirely white European as might be supposed. Around a quarter, some 455 souls were either African or of mixed African-European descent. This free community was concentrated mainly in the capital, St. George, and other towns where they mostly worked as merchants and tradesmen, but some were prosperous enough to own plantations of their own and the slaves that came with them. When the British surveyed their new island possession, they recorded Jeanette, a free Negro woman who was wealthy enough to be the owner of 82 slaves on a 160-acre estate at Tyrell Bay, which was one of Grenada's largest plantations. Piero, a free black woman, was noted as holding 38 acres and three slaves, while in 1808, Louis La Grenada, a free colored man, bequeathed freedom to 13 slaves on his death, including his favorite child, Peggy. The early years of a slave are not likely to furnish many incidents for the historian or biographer, nor have any particulars been preserved for the life of Christophe during the period of his bondage. So wrote the Methodist mi missionary William Harvey, dismissively in Sketches of Haiti, his account of a visit to the Haitian kingdom in the final year of Christophe's rule. But while the paper trail is scanty, it is still possible to recreate the world in which he was born thanks to a vivid account of slavery in Grenada left to us by Ataba Koguana, born 10 years before Christoph near Assini in modern-day Ghana. Koguana was the son of a prominent figure at the court of the local ruler, but at the age of 13 he was kidnapped by slavers, sold to an intermediary and shipped to Grenada. Later freed in England by his owner, Koguana became a prominent abolitionist campaigner in London. His 1787 narrative of the enslavement of Ataba Koguana, a native of Africa, was one of the earliest accounts in English of the slave trade written by formerly enslaved Africans. Kaguana recounts it for his readers, the terrible moment of realization when he and his fellow captives were transferred to the ship that would transport them to the Caribbean. There was nothing to be heard but the rattling of chains, smacking of whips, and the groans and cries of our fellow men. Some would not stir from the ground when they were lashed and beat in the most horrible manner. The loading continued until the ship's hold was crammed with chained and sweating bodies. Dystentery and fever spread quickly in the squalor of the tightly packed holds. During the voyage, captors were only allowed on deck briefly each day to exercise. Slave ships were slung with netting around the decks to prevent suicide by jumping overboard. The crew lived in permanent fear of their captors rising up against them, and this seems to have been the case during Kaguana's passage. With death more preferable than life, he wrote, A plan was concerted among us that we might burn and blow up the ship and to perish altogether in the flames. The plot was discovered, but although Koguana spares his readers a description of the bloody reprisals, accounts from other ships suggested these would have ranged from tortures to beheadings with the dead thrown to the sharks that always followed the slave ships on the grim voyage west. After landing, Koguana spent nine months in Grenada laboring on a sugar plantation amid conditions of brutish baseness and barbarity. Meager rations were complemented with casual violence. 
a common misdemeanor was to be caught chewing on a piece of sugar cane for sustenance while working, for which the guilty person would be lashed or have their teeth pulled out. For land clearing and hoeing to weeding to cutting, the work was endless. Even the tough razor-like leaves on the sugar cane seemed to fight against the slaves. At harvest time, they worked from before sunrise until after sunset, carrying the canes to mills that ran through the night to stop the precious sugar from fermenting and spoiling. Acts of resistance were common. Grenada's mountainous interior was refuge to populations of runaways who attempted from their own free communities. They were dubbed maroons, derived from the Spanish word cimarron, meaning wild, a term first applied to escape livestock brought by early settlers. The maroons regularly raided plantations to steal cattle and supplies, causing alarm among the colonists and the launch of retaliatory expeditions by local militias. The combined effects of hurricanes, unrest, and deterioration under a tropical climate mean that few records from Grenada exist from before 1785, and detailed searches in the archives there have yielded no clues to Christoph's precise origins. It is possible that his parents may originally have come from the Senegambia region or Sierra Leone in West Africa. In an unpublished memoir, William Wilson, an Englishman who spent time at Christoph's court as a tutor to the Prince Royal, wrote that Christoph's features shoot his Mandingo parentage, a generic term for the primarily Muslim Mandinka people of the region. Now, nah, don't tell me Christoph was out, was out that Sahil, man. Don't tell me Christoph was a Sahil. <laughs> don't tell me Christoph was out that Sahil, man. You know, man. Man, they said Christoph could have been an Igbo man, a man, Dinka man, man, Christoph man. You know, like I said, they, they said he could be from St. Kitts, Grenada. Man, it's up in the air, bro. It's up in the air, man. Uh, let's continue. In keeping up with the pseudo scientific racial classifications common at that time, Wilson observed that the Mandinka were notably tall, handsome, and natural aristocrats. The men do not find a ready sale for the same reason, perhaps, that an Englishman would rank low in a market of white slaves. He would be turbulent and impatient of forced labor and more ready to fight his owner than to serve him. Now, sorry about They said that Mandinka was, was naturally rebellious. Now, that's funny because as we can see them boys in this hill right now, you know, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, to see me go to the president of Mali, I believe he's a Mandinka. Uh, I could be wrong, but I believe he's a Mandinka. So, you know, like I said, man, we see them boys live in effect right now in a modern day. We, we can see the rebellion in full effect. You know, shout out to my boys in the Sahil, man. Let's continue. This ancestry was the perfect material William suggested for a future revolutionary and a monarch. While this could simply be read as confirmation of bias on Wilson's part, it is interesting to note that in the colonial system unveiled, vastly listed Mandinka as the first of all African races with the propensity for civilization, possibly paying a subtle tribute to his king's ancestors by describing them as civil, hospitable, hardworking cultivators with a talent for the sciences. Now, I do remember, I do remember reading a book and Vasti did say, he did say that. He did say the Mandinka were, as they said, hardworking cultivators with the, with the talent for the sciences. Let's continue. Although precise records for the arrivals of French slave ships in Grenada no longer exist, they ship relatively few captives from Senegambia or Sierra Leone to this part of the Caribbean during the 18th century. If Christoph's roots did lie there, his parents were more likely to have been brought to the island by English slave traders soon after the island changed hands in 1763. That we are reduced to such conjecture is the result of the yawning hole in the stories of those sold into slavery. Consumed with grief, their hearts filled with bitterness and despair. Nevermore would they see the land that gave them birth, wrote Vasti, of those carried across the water in chains, and whose ancestry remains forever lost. Every bond that could attach them to their former home, lives were broken, destroyed forever. He continued, a Haitian voodoo song puts it even more simply, in the belly of the slave ship, we are all one. Born of recent arrivals, rather than into the relative prosperity of Grenada's free colored class, the child Christoph entered the world in a state of bondage a baby born into slavery, did well to survive even infancy. One plantation manager on the island noted that pregnant women and infants were deliberately neglected in the hope that suckling children should die for they lost a great deal of the mother's work during the infancy of the child. <sighs> oh God. Let's continue. Planters considered it cheaper instead to keep importing fresh blood directly from Africa rather than care for the welfare of those they already enslaved. Slaves were at the bottom of the pile at a time when even the land itself seemed to rage against the inhabitants. Christoph was born at the peak of the Caribbean hurricane season, when the simple thatched huts that made up the majority of slave quarters would have offered meager shelter to a nursing mother and infant. In 1770, when Christoph was three and still too young to be put to work, sugar ants ravaged agriculture across the island. I have seen the roads covered by them for miles together, wrote one witness to the plague, 
so crowded were they in many places that the print of the horse's feet would appear for a moment or two until filled up by the surrounding multitude. The insects will return annually for almost a decade until they were finally wiped out by a hurricane that also laid waste to much of the island. In the same period, the main port of St. George's was twice destroyed by fire, while remote coastal communities feared the raiding parties of the pirates who landed on moonlit nights to kidnap slaves to sell elsewhere. While the Africans labored on the plantations and in the houses and workshops of the free, the colonists themselves were split by sectarian division. Incoming Protestant settlers from England and Scotland repeatedly clashed with the French Catholics who had preceded them. The outbreak of the American Revolution in 1775 saw a brief declaration of unity when the island assembly voiced open support for the rebel North American colonists in whom they saw reflected in their own familiar grievances about colonial tariffs and restrictions on free trade. But when France joined the war against the British, Grenada's governor feared that half the white population would turn against him. Grenada was left dangerously exposed to invasion when the Royal Navy's formidable Caribbean fleet sailed from the region in mid-1779 to protect merchant ships en route to Britain. A local militia had been raised to supplement the small garrison of regular soldiers at St. George, but in reality only the loyalty of the British colonists could be depended on. In the event, such small numbers proved inconsequential. When the French fleet of 25 ships of the line and 10 frigates were sighted on the horizon on the 2nd of July, the days of the British rule in Grenada were numbered. The commander of the French forces was Admiral Jean-Baptiste Charles Henri, the Comte de Stang, now in his 50th year. De Stang was a veteran of the Seven Years' War, where he was captured during the French siege of Madras, paroled and then taken prisoner again after leading a fleet against the British in Sumatra. Despite this poor luck, he still managed to rise through the ranks, and at the world's conclusion, he was rewarded by being made the governor of saint Domingue. He served there for two years before becoming the naval inspector at Brest, the French Navy's most important port where he was working when war was declared against the British. He quickly set sail to take his battle back to the old enemy. Despite the modest size of the British forces, the battle for Grenada was a bloody one. The British refused the French articles of surrender, so the Stang ordered the sacking of St. George. When the Royal Navy eventually returned and attempted to retake the island, they lost two ships in a disastrous fight with the French fleet, and the British governor was sent to Paris as a prisoner of war. The governor's high status ensured him a relatively comfortable captivity, but other prisoners were less fortunate. Any free colored members of the population found to be carrying arms were taken into slavery as possession of the French crown. The island's enslaved population simply swapped one set of masters for another. The Stang stayed less than a fortnight on the island. Returning Grenada to French rule was a prize in itself, but it was only one piece in a larger war against the British. His fleet was due to sail to North America to lend support to the rebel colonists. To do this, he had to pick up fresh troops and supplies from saint Domingue. Flushed from their victory over the British, the French prepared to leave Grenada. The Stang's officers counted the governor's silver plate as one of the spoils of war. Others reportedly took humans as prizes, leaving with members of Grenada's enslaved population to serve them in the coming campaigns. The fact that Christophe was taken from Grenada by this method has become part of the foundational myth of his life, with the first accounts appearing in the last years of Christophe's reign as king. The Haitian historian Joseph Saint Remy writing in the middle of the 19th century has given us the most detailed version, albeit without citing his sources. According to Saint Remy, the 11-year-old Christophe was on an errand for his master, traveling from Sartres in the north of Grenada to Saint George, when he was met by an unnamed French officer. This officer asked if Christophe would join his service. Christophe was apparently so charmed by the officer's appearance and eager to escape his current situation that he happily accepted the offer. In reality, a young enslaved boy would have rather less likely to experience the encounter in quite the fairy tale manner that St. Remy suggests. Though in later life, Christophe certainly proved adept at grabbing whatever opportunities came his way. The fate of Christophe's mother and father, along with their identities, remains unknown. But as the French fleet set sail, Whatever childhood he had managed to eke out in Grenada slipped over the horizon forever. Born to captives brought from Africa, he now faced his own uncertain passage by ship. Christophe was heading to war. Now, yeah, I believe uh, this is uh, around the time where the American Revolution was taking off and the French were about to go to North America to help out the American colonists. So Christophe was the child in the American Revolution. And I guess this is one account of how he ended up from Grenada to the American Revolution back to the colony of Saint-Domingue. Now, let's continue. On Franklin Square in Savannah, Georgia, five uniformed figures pose in bronze atop a giant granite plinth. They are French soldiers from Saint-Domingue, raising their muskets against an unseen army of British redcoats who had captured the city during the American Revolutionary War. One of their numbers sits slumped and wounded showing the price the unit had paid during the subsequent siege. 
to their right, a boy, not yet in his teens, but in the same uniform as the others, looks across in alarm at his fallen comrade and attempts to beat out a report on the drum that weighs him down. But something unusual marks this monument out from all the others that commemorate the war. The soldiers are black, and the German boy is the young Christoph. That part played in the 1779 Siege of Savannah by the Chasse Volontaire, the free black soldiers from saint omain depicted in the statue is a celebrated one in Haiti. When the French threw their military weight behind the American Republic against the hated British, nearly 550 free black soldiers sailed from the French Caribbean colony to join the fight. By their action in the cause of liberty, they are seen as the precursors of those who would fight in the Haitian Revolution and the list of those who are said to have served in a who's who of that later struggle. Christoph was among the number is a key part of this piece of national mythology. In his 1819 history of the Haitian Revolution, Baron de Vasti was quite clear. The king served in the wars of the United States of America and was wounded at the Siege of Savannah. But as with many details of Christoph's birth in early years, a child soldier who was possibly enslaved or possibly free slips easily through the gaps in the archive, and sorting fact from fiction is a slippery affair. Christoph would have had two weeks to adapt to life on board the Destang fleet as it sailed from Grenada to the port of Cap Francais in saint omain to pick up more troops for the American campaign. He would not have been the only child on board. Every ship had its complement of cabin boys, known as mooses, and boys even younger than him were common, learning the ropes and serving officers until they were old enough to work as sailors. Free black sailors were common across the Caribbean, and slave ships working the Middle Passage were known to put African boys to work and to train them up as sailors to enhance the market value. Cap Francais was one of the most prosperous cities in the Americas, far overshadowing the colony's capital, Port-au-Prince to the south. It had been established on the island of Hispaniola in 1670 by French colonists less than 32 kilometers from the spot where Columbus had attempted to reestablish the first European settlement in the Americas on Christmas Day, 1492. The land was home to the Taino people, and under their chief, Guacana Carique, they had initially aided Columbus, but as more ships arrived from the east, each driven by Spain's insatiable appetite for the riches of what they had thought was the gateway to China, the Taino were ravaged by European arms and disease. Those who survived were forced to labor in the Spanish hunt for gold. By the middle of the 16th century, the genocide was almost complete. Just as Spain started to lose interest in Hispaniola altogether in favor of the far greater wealth flowing from its new conquest over the Aztec and Inca empires, the promise of Spain's first American colony was reduced to it becoming a transit point for the bullion rich convoys of galleons returning to the mother country, and much of the island was abandoned to the ghosts of its original inhabitants. Freebooters filled the vacuum, and Hispaniola became a haven for buccaneers during the golden age of Caribbean piracy, with its most notorious port on the island of Tortuga off the northwest coast. As France expanded its imperial ambitions in the region, it slowly took control of the western portion of Hispaniola and suppressed the wider excesses of the pirates, gradually turning them into tobacco cultivators. When Cap Francais was established, it quickly became the most important port in their new colony of saint omain created when Spain formally ceded ownership of the western third of the island in 1697. It was the introduction of sugar to saint omain that allowed France to do what Spain never managed and turn the colony into a going concern. When the Comte d'Estaing's fleet arrived in Cap Francais, the port was undergoing its boom years and was the heart of France's Caribbean empire, with its dockside warehouses piled high with hogs head of sugar to feed the metropole's sweet tooth, along with coffee, cotton, indigo, and other agricultural produce. Of this, Christophe would initially have seen little. Having joined the fleet as the spoils of war, it is unlikely that he would have been allowed on shore during the two weeks that d'Estaing was spent in the port, for fear that he would abscond. For him, Cap Francais remained on the horizon, a line of gleaming stone buildings in the bright Caribbean light with their neatly tiled roofs and church towers pushed up against the green peak of the Mont du Cap. But even seen from the deck, the buildings clearly demonstrated the colony's importance, as did the guns of the heavily fortified batteries that the fleet had to pass under as it steered through the narrow passage in the reefs that guarded the harbor entrance. And while his ship was moored among a forest of masts and small boats flittled back and forth from the wars, Christoph would have understood the ultimate source of the city's wealth. Amid the frigates and ships of the line and the merchant sloops being loaded with barrels of sugar and bales of cotton, the slave ships carried a far grimmer cargo. saint omain was the largest slave society in the Caribbean. Cap Francais had no formal slave market, and when a new slave ship arrived from Africa, buyers would be rowed into the bay to view those to be sold on board. A detailed painting of the slave ship, the Mary Seraphique of Nancy's, shows the vessel in the harbor in 1773. Following its third transatlantic slave voyage, 
Dozens of naked Africans from Angola are brought up from the hole by the crew to be paraded before the prospective customers. A rich feast has been laid for the wealthy citizens of Cap Francais, with the artists mockingly including several African children clustered around the coat sails and raised glasses of the dinners. The gentility of the meal takes place on the half deck friendly behind the safety of the barricado. The tall wooden wall erected on all slave ships to protect the crew quarters and to provide a firing position from which to quell potential onboard rebellions. A landing boat brings new buyers alongside the ship, while another rows back to shore carrying the enslaved to their fate. Two of the buyers are women and are attended by black maids. One is white, the other mixed race. Like Grenada, Saint-Domingue had a free colored population, many of whom owned slaves themselves. The painting records that the Mary Seraphique spent a month at Cap Francais following his voyages from Angola, and that in that time, Captain Gaugi sold 333 Africans into slavery, 187 men and 73 women, and 73 children. The Mary Seraphique was far from unusual. Cap Francais was the destination for one third of all French transatlantic slave voyages, and at the colony's height, it was consuming nearly 20,000 slaves a year. Now, time out, we gotta keep in mind when it mentions that the so-called colored population owned slaves. They're talking about the uh, the offspring of the white colonists and the African women, right? They were uh, they own slaves. Now let's continue. Christoph may well have witnessed such a scene from the deck of his ship while the fleet was taking on the colonial soldiers that Saint Domingue was providing for the war against the British. The sale of slaves would have been no shock to someone born into bondage, but even if he had not previously seen the haggling for flesh over brandy and bone china. The new troops who came on board would have been a shock to him. In their dark blue coats with green cuffs, white breeches, and yellow plume hats, they were every bit as impressive as any of the finely dressed colonists. But crucially, they looked exactly like Kristoff. In Grenada, he had just witnessed white Europeans fighting each other while the islands enslaved and free-colored populations looked on from the sidelines. But in Saint-Domingue, free black men were setting sail to fight the British. The soldiers, known as the Chasseur Volontaire, had been raised specifically as part of France's support for the American revolutionaries. Like all colonies, Saint-Domingue had a militia for local defense, but the white population often resented military service, which extended to helping settle civil disputes and catching runaway slaves. Conversely, the free colored population often saw joining the militia as a way of gaining social status. When he served as governor of the colony, the Stang had recognized the abilities of the free colored militia and sought to expand their military role to the dismay of the majority of the colonists. Though increasingly unwilling to serve at arms themselves, they were even more reluctant to have large numbers of non-white soldiers in the garrisons. As a result, all militia units had to be commanded by a white officer, and no man of color was allowed to rise above the rank of a sergeant. The prospect of fighting in a war against Britain offered more excitement than regular military service. Patriotic fervor was fanned by Afish American, Cap Francais made newspaper, which encouraged men to enlist by asking, what Frenchman does not experience a reawakening of his courage and ardor to fight against the enemies of the state? Recruitment was further encouraged by the active support of Captain Vincent Olivier, the city's most celebrated free black officer and a friend of the Stang. Vincent was reportedly 119 years old and had been given his freedom from slavery following a French raid on Cartagena in 1697. What the hell? Yet few white colonists heeded the call. As a result, when the fleet finally sailed from Cap Francais, more than three quarters of the 700 newly raised militia were from the free colored community. Some of the new recruits were perhaps motivated less by patriotism or the excitement of going to war than by the need to resolve their legal status. Several of the recruits passed themselves off as free when entering the service while still remaining technically enslaved. A government dispensation waived the cost of slave manumissions to those in uniform during a time of war. Is it possible that it was this mechanism that allowed the young Christoph to attain his freedom? Bound Vasti omits any suggestion of enslavement from his comment that the king had served in Savannah. But Hélas Dumelz, a Haitian writer who toured northern Haiti soon after Christoph's death and who was a fierce critic of his rule, says that he was freed by right following the Savannah campaign. The advertisements for runaway slaves published in Afish American in the following years contained several mentions of those claiming that they had received their liberty as a result of their service under the stank. One of them, the smallpox scarred Jean Pierre, had been 16 at the time of the Savannah campaign. So had Jean Lefebvre, a mixed race wig maker from Port au Prince, who said that he had signed up with his Mason brother Jean Baptiste. Service as a drummer was also customarily accepted as a justification for manumission as its prominent battlefield role attracted plenty of enemy fire. 
It was this role that Kristoff played in the Savannah campaign, according to a popular Haitian tradition. Whether in such a short period of time, Kristoff could have learned the complicated drum rolls needed during maneuvers is a moot point. The muster rolls from the Chassevonne there has not survived, and the names of only relatively few enlisted men are known. After the siege of Savannah, Veterans of the Chasse Volontaire would have found themselves welcomed into a larger network of free colored officers, militia, and rural police in northern Saint Domingue. Military service was seen as one area where those of African descent could advance socially within a network that offered status and support to its members, especially for those without kinship ties or other connections to white colonists. The young Christoph would certainly have taken advantage of those connections. One figure at the center of this network was the Senegalese born Jean Baptiste Belly, who has served at Savannah and was a lieutenant in the city's militia by 1781. He was a popular and well-connected figure. Between 1777 and 1788, he appeared as a legal witness to 60 baptisms, marriages, and funerals in Cafuense for the city's free black community. Christophe and Belly would later serve together when revolutionary fires swept across the city, and they likely met for the first time when Christophe was working at the hotel, with Christophe perhaps even serving him a drink in January 1784 after Belly had been named godfather at the baptism of Noel Cuaravid, a child who would one day become Christophe's brother-in-law. A support network was essential in order to thrive in a deeply segregated city like Cap Francais. For a person with black skin, freedom still meant anything but equality with the white colonists. Throughout the 18th century, the colonial authorities found themselves increasingly afraid of saint man's growing and increasingly prosperous free colored community. Nearly a quarter of the colony slaves were owned by those who had some African ancestry, and many poor whites who had come to the colony to make their fortunes had only done so by marrying free black women for their wealth. Women who were subsequently vilified in racist screeds for their allegedly insatiable sexual appetites. <sighs> My God. But uh, we got to keep in mind when they talk about uh, a quarter of the colony slaves were owned by those who had some African ancestry. Keep in mind, those were the sons and daughters of the colonists themselves. So, you know, you got to be uh, you got to watch out for the deceptive language. Uh, let's continue. The mixed race offspring horrified white observers. In his history of Saint Omang, Moreau de Saint Mary embraced Enlightenment racial theory by classifying the colonies' people according to their ratio of white and non-white blood, from mulattoes and quadroons to those who appeared phenotypically white, yet whose race was kept in legal doubt by having a mother who was one eighth black. To keep Saint Omang's free colored population further in check, a series of laws forbade them from practicing law or medicine or giving their children French names. A law passed in 1779 forbade them from affecting the dress, hairstyles, or, or style of whites. The colony's consensus even clearly demarcated those who had some European ancestry and were likely to have been born free. They were known as jeunes et couleurs, from those whose free status was somehow stained by their former enslaved status. They were known as neg libre. Racial discrimination seeped into every facet of life. When he became king, Christophe regularly enjoyed the opera a love that he would have developed in colonial Cap Francais. Such was the wealth and prestige of the city. The marriage of Figaro was performed here only months after making his debut in Paris, but if Christophe had attended this performance, he would have had to sit at the back of the theater in segregated seating that reinforced the colony's racial and social hierarchy, while still allowing for the improving effects of high culture. In the words of one official in the similarly ran sugar colony of Martinique, exposure to French theaters caused those of African descent to lose some of their barbarity of their origin, allowing them to become civilized in the manners and the customs. Christophe's Catholic faith was also likely forged during this time. Attending services at the Grand Parish Church on Place d'Armes, he may have even gained further insight into what a free and prosperous life for a black man might look like in saint omain A free coachman named Toussaint Breda, 25 years Christophe's elder, was a regular attendee and had his own bench in the church for his family. Now, I just want to make a slight correction. Um, whether Christoph was Catholic or not, I don't know, but I do know that his sister-in-law was one of the biggest voodoo priestesses in the entire island. I know that for a fact. I know that for a fact. I know she presided over the ceremony at Bois Caimon in 1791 at the beginning of the revolution. That was Christoph's sister-in-law. So I think Christoph was a mix of the two, right? Christoph was a mix of the, of the Catholicism and African spirituality. And let's continue. Toussaint had been formerly enslaved on the Breda plantation that gave him his name and was still working for his former master after a brief attempt to make his way as a coffee planter. Like the infant, Noel Cuadavid, Christophe would soon know the coachman well, serving as one of his most trusted lieutenants after he rechristened himself at Toussaint Louverture. But for the present time, the two could only listen to the bells and contemplate their meaning. When they toiled for a funeral, the local black population would say, one good white is dead, the wicked ones remain. 
Working at the busy hotel, Christoph would have caught many important events in the life of the city. In July 1781, he would have rushed outside at the sound of an enormous explosion that sank the powder ship of Admiral de Grasse, who was on his way to fight the British in their American colonies, in the American colonies. In April 1784, patrons would have shared news of the hot air balloon that had flown over the Gallifet plantation. While later that year, he would have taken cover as a series of earthquakes shook the city, one of which was strong enough to destroy a dozen houses. And throughout this period, there would have been the constant passage of buyers making their way down to the WAF when a new slave ship moored in the harbor carrying its sad cargo from Africa. The hunger for captives was insatiable. In 1790 alone, 66 ships arrived in the port carrying nearly 17,500 captives. Some 336 people fed every week into the slave machine. The modest freedoms that some slaves enjoyed in the Cap Francais at the Sunday markets were in stark contrast to the lives their compatriots endured on the plantation. On the northern plain and beyond, they were awoken before dawn and labored until sunset. The strongest among them planted and harvest sugarcane while children weeded around the plants. What free time they had was dedicated to their garden plots, as proprietors often ignored their obligations to provide food in order to increase their own profit margins. During harvest time, the slaves were worked even harder. Mills and boiling plants ran around the clock so that freshly cut cane would not spoil before it could be processed. Skilled artisans, such as those overseeing the refining process, were treated with relative privilege, as were those working in the master's house, but all were subjected to the empire of the whip. The 1672 Code Noir that set out laws for the treatment of slaves was honored largely in the breach. The vast numbers of slaves brought to saint Omang were testaments to the planters' cold economic calculation that their bottom line was better served by working their slaves to death than by investing in their welfare. Mortality rates among the enslaved were so high that numbers could only be sustained by importing more and more and more into the colony. Birth rates were so low that some masters offered financial rewards to women who successfully weaned their infants, many of whom were only born as a result of rapes. Women who had abortions were often targeted for special punishment by depriving the planter of their future property. And so it was that on each plantation there existed a white despot who had the barbaric right of life and death over the unfortunate blacks in his keep, wrote Bound de Vasti in the Colonial System Unveiled published in Haiti in 1814. Death hovered over our heads as over those of the lowliest animals, and when they wanted to deal it out to us, the only thing that gave them any pause was the question of which form of punishment was to choose. Vasti laid out an unflinching catalog of the horrors perpetrated, named individuals, masters, and overseers on the Gallifet plantation where the hot air balloon had been raised. The owner was notorious for having his slaves hamstrung, rubbing hot peppers into whipping wounds, and submerging in Calcerchant workers in a dark water-filled dungeon. Among colonists, this plantation was considered one of the best run in the region. A popular planter's saying was to be happy as a Gallifet slave. Vasti demurred. The slaves of saint Omang were civilly dead. They inhabited this earth as if they did not really inhabit it. They lived as if they were not really living. In 1788, when the slaves attempted to hold one plantation owner to account for staking two women to death, accused of poisoning to the ground and burning their legs, he defended himself by saying that only violence could keep slaves in their place. The officials found in his favor. This brutality was technically illegal under the Code Noir, but planters who were outnumbered nearly 10 to 1 in saint Omang by the enslaved saw it as the only way to maintain order. Now, I guess we can uh, we can wrap up part one right here. We can wrap up part one right here. I'm on page, um, what page am I on? I'm on page 89, and we got like 500 pages. So, you know, lock in, man, lock in. I'm going to try to get this done this week, right? I'm going to try to get this done this week. I'm going to try to upload, uh, you know, part one, part two, part three, each night this week, hopefully, I can, you know, I, you know, I got stuff to do, but hopefully, I'm gonna make time for it. You know, I'm very excited about this book. I've been trying to get my hands on this book for a little while, so it's time, man. It's time. The latest biography of Christoph, man. You know, written by Paul Clammer. Shout out to Paul Clammer. Anyways, man, it's your boy Never Car. That's a lay back in the billet. Yes, indeed. Cash app in the description. Support the album, man. Support the album. Peace. No. Feel like I'm 75. Know that your team be full of them traders. You know that can never be mine. I'm grabbing a thought when I drive. Back in my zone and we young She said that she ready to come be my wifey And hoping I don't do her wrong I gave her my word in this bone I'm whipping the best like a lamb I mean no chicken and lamb Accustomed to call me the man I never be up on the gram I'm keeping that way undercover She want me to tell her I love her I told her I'm breaking the rules I told her we making the news Back in my city they loving me Standing alone I'm a hundred
bloody deeds. Enemy plotting is still in reach. They trying to make sure that we underneath. Trying to make sure that we never make it. Coming for power, come get acquainted. Coming for everything that I wanted. Feeling like Drake, but I really wrote it. Feeling like Kendrick, I'm checking names. Gotta roll up while I go insane. Got so much stress, I've been getting away. Stuffing these racks in this Louis case. One thing for certain, I'm about to check. Keeping 100 and nothing less. Stick with the family since day one. Had to stay down in my day come. Had to stay down, but I'm never patient. Hop on the mic and I'm motivated. Hop on the mic and I drive a classic. Haters can't see me, they copy glasses. Back in the studio, make it match. Got a new tape and it's in production. Back on my business, I got a budget. Staying low key when I'm out in public. Feel like I'm 75. None of your team be full of them traders. You know that can never be mine. I'm grabbing a thought when I drive. I'm back in my zone and we young. She said that she ready to come be my wife. Yeah, hoping I don't do her wrong. I gave her my word in this bone. I'm webbing the best like a lamb. I mean, no chicken and lamb. Accustomed to call me the man. I never be up on the grand. I'm keeping that way on the cover. She want me to tell her I love her. I told her I'm breaking the rules. I told her we making the news. Breaking the rules, yeah, yeah. Know that we're making it new.